The freedom that comes with driving a car is a privilege most 16 year olds can't wait to embrace. It's a major step towards independence and growing up. But many teens aren't getting the chance to grow up. They're dying on our area highways. In this program, you'll learn about the extraordinary number of teens we're losing and about new legislation pending in Pennsylvania. And we'll examine the issues surrounding driver's education and driving under the influence. This program will show our teens are legally old enough to drive. But certainly too young to die. It's a typical day leaving school. Think your child's a safe driver? Parents of these teens probably think so too. Talk to just about any teenager and they'll likely be able to tell you horror stories about their peers. Changing lanes without looking, just, you know, oh, the person behind me is going to stop. You know, um, oh, it's, it's a 35 mile an hour curve. I can take it at 60. People cut you off and, uh, and change lanes and ride right up behind the people and everything that you learned in driver's ed is not practiced. Most know someone who's been in a crash or have had one themselves. I was in my own minor scrape this year and plus I've had another friend that's been in a big accident and nearly lost his legs. I was in an accident with my brother. Uh, he was tuning the radio and uh, kind of lost control, veered off to the right, hit a truck. Sometimes there are stories that make you cringe. I remember seeing a tree and the only thing I remember after that is I remember waking up in the car and seeing the broken glass and realize what happened. I felt a lot of pain. My, I mean, my left ankle was really hurting really bad and I knew that it was broken because every time that I would move my leg, my foot would actually stay in the same spot. It wouldn't move no matter which way I moved my leg and it hurt really bad. I could tell my arm was broken. I knew I had a cut on this eye because I could, I kept feeling the blood like run down my face. Matt Bozick was 15 and sitting in the passenger seat. I was just so surprised. I never thought that this would actually happen to me. I remember going into the ER and I was scared to death because I didn't know what was going to happen to me. Matt spent almost two weeks in the hospital. The ride home was traumatic. For months, he feared riding in a car, but in time, that wore off. Matt is now 17 years old. He crashed a car a few weeks ago. Basically, uh, I was speeding, and I seen something in the middle of the road, and I just lost control. I seen the tree coming. I felt the impact, and then I realized, I was like, oh, man, this happened again. Matt was going 50 miles per hour when he hit the tree. He wasn't wearing a seat belt. I knew it was broken in half because my whole leg was just folded in half, literally. The car began to burn. Matt crawled out of a window. And I got about, I'd say it was six feet in the middle of the road, about 10 or 15 feet away from the car, and the car just went. Matt will recover again, but life is anything but fun right now. It's been really hard, because, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on, having to deal with the insurance companies, and, I mean, having to worry about like what other people are saying, like just people talking about how like parents calling me up saying you should drive slower. Still, Matt is one of the lucky ones. Many teens never live to tell their stories. Instead, their friends live with the aftermath. She just screamed out, they're dead. And I threw the phone across the room and I, I went hysterical. I was holding on to my pictures going, no, it's not happening, it's not happening. But it was happening. Karen Dellinger's best friends and the boy she loved died in a crash. The accident occurred as it was traveling northbound on Locust Point Road at a high rate of speed, went over a hill on the roadway, became airborne, uh, lost control, went off the roadway, and started to flip and roll. Throwing the boys from the car, three of them died. 16-year-old Blake Evans, 15-year-old Wade Teal, and 15-year-old Daxter Schaefer. None were wearing seat belts. They had doubled the 40 mile per hour speed limit. I don't think that they were doing anything but having a good time. I don't think that any of them said, put your seatbelt on or slow down. The teens were sophomores at Cumberland Valley High School. Memories washed through the minds of their shocked and saddened friends. He loved to be the center of attention, and he loved to, to make crazy faces, and him and Blake were, were best friends. Wade was on the soccer team. He was uh, starting goalie. He was National Honor Society, you know, good students, they were all good students. There was no alcohol involved at all. Everybody was coming uh, from an activity uh, at a private residence. 
and they were all just going home. And uh, it was just a mistake that ended in tragedy. A tragedy that became painfully real at their funerals. When I went up there, I just, I stood there and just looked at him, you know, and I held his hand and I gave him a kiss on his forehead and mm -hmm. I just stood there and I just, I did not believe it. You didn't want to believe it. Mm -hmm. And then going there and in my case, seeing my best friend laying, mm -hmm. laying there still without a smile on his face, you know, and mm -hmm. that to me is the scariest thing. This kind of stuff doesn't happen to kids, you know, we're only 15 and 16. The girls cling to memories, Wade's silver chain and a few pictures. Returning to school was painful. You're coming to school and you're, you're looking for them. And you're, you're looking at the old places you used to meet and you're, you're waiting for them. It's like your stomach is just hollow. It's just like everything drains out of you and you feel like you can't think, you can't move, you can't talk, you just, you just sit there. Only after months and months of counseling have the girls started to live again. They've grown and aged, and they've changed. I never used to wear a seatbelt, ever. When I got in the car, oh, you know, I'm fine. Just sit back, relax, turn on the music. Uh, now I can't start a car without putting a seatbelt on. Just don't take anything for granted, you know? What you have today it may not be there tomorrow. It's not guaranteed. You got to just make your hugs a little bit longer and tighter, and, you know, you choose your words because you never know when something's gonna happen. Nothing, nothing hits you harder until it happens to someone that you love, you know, and, and they were loved by everyone. The heartache resulting from teenage crashes is obvious, so how do we curb them? Some say we should start where teens are learning to drive. Often that's at school, in driver's education. I'm gonna make a right on the highway. This is a critical spot right here. Obviously, if you live in Dillsburg or anywhere around, you're gonna come out here. You got to deal with it, and uh, it's not an easy spot to handle. David Perry's been teaching driver's education at Northern High School for about 20 years. He's one of two full-time teachers. I'll give you a little warning. You want you want to be any closer at this point? You know, as your speed increases, your falling distance also wants. 16-year-old Erica Myers is learning to drive. There are trucks all around her on Route 15. Highway driving is the most nerve-wracking part of her behind-the-wheel class. Oh, she's having no problem with that, um, and there are a big variety of speeds. I think uh, the concept of speed itself, um, and, and especially making turns and going through curves, they tend to have a real, real tough time with that. That's one reason the driver ed car has an extra brake for the teacher, but it's a tool Perry doesn't like to use. Even if I see that they're going to be making a mistake. I like to, for the most part, make their mistakes on their own and not have me always, you know, beforehand helping them out with that. It's nice to have. It's, uh, I think it's a reason why I have most of my hair and most of it's not, not too gray. Erica's also driving with her parents. It varies. Some of the kids uh, get a lot at home, like Erica, and some of them, you know, the parents say, hey, that's their job to, you know, our job to, to teach them. David Gerberich learned his skills from his parents. No formal driver training is required to get a driver's license. He's one of a handful that takes the class after obtaining his license. It still certainly benefits him to take it, and I know he's getting, you know, to see some things, uh, both some good things and bad things that, that you know, he can do to, uh, to incorporate into his own driving and make himself a better driver. The Pennsylvania Department of Education requires six hours of driving and 30 hours of classroom instruction for an approved school curriculum. Is that really enough time behind the wheel? I think teens have, are involved in more accidents uh, just because of the experience factor, the lack of experience. In fact, an accident involving the driver's ed car is the main lesson in today's classroom session. The speed limit out here on Old York Road is what? 55, that's right. Perry and the students were waiting to turn left when a car approached from behind. I tell you, I still see it in my, in my dreams. Uh, my nightmares is more like it. And I see this car just absolutely bearing down on us. And I know as soon as I look there, he's not slowing down. And we got absolutely hammered. No skid marks. The guy hit us going a full 55, 60 mile an hour. The accident is a good learning tool. Discussed are the importance of seatbelts and keeping the wheels straight while waiting to turn. 
In this case, a teen was not at fault. A 45-year-old man using cruise control caused the crash. Even if you guys do everything right, there are other people out on the road that, that aren't. And we're all human. We make mistakes. There are 342 approved driver's ed programs in Pennsylvania's 501 public school districts. However, they vary from school to school. Littlestown High School in Adams County has only one part-time driver's ed teacher, and students must pay $25 to get behind the wheel. The waiting list is long, one year or more. Most people sign up their sophomore, junior year, and uh, usually if you don't sign up by then, there's no point in signing up because there's so many people on the list. Although many students will take the course after getting their license, they still want the credits. After I pass the fee behind the wheel, I will uh, get my insurance deduction. Um, it also will look, look good that I've you know, been a well-rounded driver. Um, and the sooner, I can, uh, the sooner I get that behind the wheel, uh, the more experience I get. You learn something new every day, but it really helped. I mean, they really showed me what there is to know. And a lot of times I get into a situation and I look back and think about what they told me. They learn traffic laws and how to drive in adverse conditions. Although Jay Moran would like more time with the students, it's better than nothing. Across the board, I think there's many cases that uh, can say that a kid has changed their mind due to some of the knowledge that they've gathered from a driver's ed program. But 43 public schools in Pennsylvania teach only classroom theory, and 116 have no program at all. York County's Spring Grove School District dropped its courses in 1995. We had uh, approximately a teacher, full-time teacher, plus some other assistants, and as we looked at enrollments growing, we saw that we would have to expand that. Parents and students wanted the course to stay. The school board looked at the financial picture. We looked at resources at that time and, and how we would use them. Uh, the feeling was that driver education was not a core component of our curriculum. Uh, and that we should look at using those resources for other academic areas. In November, three Spring Grove students died in a crash in East Berlin. The teens ran a stop sign. Right now, the Education Department reimburses schools with approved programs, $35 per student. But is that enough? That's the same $35 they've been getting probably since the 50s. Now, school after school has either cut back on driver's ed or they're not offering at all. There are no statistics proving that driver's education reduces teen crashes. Driver's ed as it exists now is really uh, a program that I think has been stripped of its real value. AAA says driver's ed programs must be expanded to truly be effective. More time, more teachers, more money from the state. That's where the present system fails. We're not making them better drivers. We're not preparing them. All we're really doing is letting them take a test let them get on the road, and then we just hope they're going to get through those first couple of years. There is a limit of what driver's education teachers can do and what they can enforce. They are bound by state laws. Currently, Pennsylvania is just one of 16 states in the country using a three-step graduated licensing process. Pennsylvania's teenage death toll is 23 percent lower than the national average. State officials credit their three-step licensing system. And the first step in that process is for someone to apply for a learner's permit. And to do that, they have to uh, first have a physical examination done to make sure they're in good health. That exam includes a vision test and a knowledge test on safety issues. Applicants must be 16 years old. And they have to spend a minimum of 30 days with the learner's permit learning how to drive with a licensed driver right beside them. Then they can take their road test. Okay, if you're ready to begin, Go ahead and start your vehicle. Sandy Olet is hoping to get her license. First, she must parallel park. Okay, and over there, what you want to do is you want to try not to hit the curb or the cones. Okay? You want to be within six inches to a foot away from the curb. This is the first hurdle. If she passes, she can continue with the road test. Just relax and try to think of everything you need to do. She's cleared. Now they pull onto the road. Okay, what we're looking for is to make sure that she can handle the vehicle in a safe manner. Uh, she's driving very safe, uh, judgments in traffic. Sandy knows the drill. This is her third try at passing the test. What happened the last time she was in, uh, she wasn't making her full stops at the uh, traffic lights. She was turning right on red and she wasn't coming to a full stop and looking for traffic. What she'd done is uh, there was a car coming and she pulled out in front of the car. Her second try at the test wasn't much better. The second time, 
I misjudged a light and ran it when it was red. But today, everything is correct. Congratulations, you passed your test. You've done a very good job. You parallel parked perfect. That was a real good job. Was it just luck or have her skills really improved? It's hard to know. Sandy learned and practiced at home. Well, we started out in parking lots and we happened to live in a trailer park so that I went into the trailer park next. Then I went into back roads and then onto the city. Just maybe about an hour each time. PennDOT passes about 80% of new drivers the first time. Examiners assign points for each mistake. 31 points is a failure. Anything 31 or over you fail for. Anything under 30 is you do pass. From here, 16 and 17 year olds get a junior license. With the junior license, the main restriction is that uh, that young person is not allowed to, uh, to drive between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. Night driving accounts for just 20% of teens driving, but 50% of their crashes do happen at night. By limiting night driving, officials hope to limit the crashes as well. If a 16-year-old has a clean driving record for the first year, a regular adult license is granted by the age of 17. PennDOT says it's a good system and says customers are pleased. All the feedbacks that we've received, customers are generally happy with the, the way we're giving the test and they think it's fair. If Pennsylvania is already a national leader in preparing young drivers, is there anything more our legislators can do to make sure our teens are safe on the highways? Some say yes, but it'll take help from parents. Statistically, nationwide, there are approximately 6,300 teenagers killed every year in this country. Uh, that averages out to about 17 a day. Car crashes are the leading cause of death for teenagers. Teen crashes are eerily similar, often involving just one car and an inability to react to distraction. But no skills test is going to pinpoint whether a young driver will consistently speed, take wild chances, or just act childishly. Pennsylvania is looking at some enhancements, change the mandatory learner permit time from 30 days to six months, and require parents to prove they've supervised their teen for a minimum number of hours. Also under consideration is limiting the number of teen passengers for junior license holders, something teens aren't too keen on. One teenage passenger for a junior license person uh, depends on the maturity of the driver. Uh, the age, I don't feel that the age should matter. Other considerations include a 90-day driving suspension for junior drivers with six points. But is this really enough to change teenage behavior? If we purely and solely depend upon the government to take care of our children, uh, we won't very much like the results we get. So PennDOT is giving parents more power by notifying them when their teen drivers are cited for violations. And the way that the parents can exert that fundamental authority over their young people is that at any time when their young person is holding a, young, a junior license and the parents so desire, they can revoke their permission for their young person to have that license and in fact the license will be revoked. But will parents respond and take the initiative? Many are unaware of the true dangers until it's too late. He fell asleep, wrecked, and died in a fiery crash. He was just a kid. It's an emotional, devastating, closed casket funeral. We could have understood better if he had died for his country, but he just died trying to see his mother. The teenage accidents seem to touch you more because they're younger people and they're uh, so inexperienced, most of them, that it, it uh, always sticks, sticks in your heart. Officer Jim Boddington has 21 years in police work. He's seen too many crashes and worries about his own two sons and how to teach them about safety. Trying to make a teenager do anything uh, is a very, very difficult task. Uh, you can tell a teenager a hundred times not to do something and they're not going to believe you. So he's making a scrapbook with newspaper clippings of serious accidents, each page dedicated to a lost teen. When they became of driving age, I could show them the book and give them tangible uh, information and evidence where you know other people have made mistakes and what can happen or how quickly it can happen. This is just one method of reaching your children. I think that uh, a lot of parents should consider having a driver's contract with their child right from the very beginning. So teens might avoid breaking the rules if they know what punishment will follow. 
Teens are largely influenced by their friends, but many admit what is taught at home can make a difference. You're, you're not going to get it done unless it's done within the home. Like your parents have to say, buckle your seatbelt every time. You know what I mean? It's just, it has to be second nature. Saving the lives of our children can't be done without help from home. In fact, parents are the ones who set the example when it comes to drinking and driving. And the importance of that can't be overstated. As Susan Schrack shows us, drug or alcohol related crashes put thousands of teenagers in the hospital every year. I think a lot of times uh, teens take for granted the whole safety issue. Uh, they think that a lot of times the, st the statistics and things that they see on the news can't happen to them. The perception of immortality is tough to change. Nurses at Maryland's Shock Trauma Center are tackling that task. They talk to teens who've been cited for drug or alcohol violations. Me and two boys, we left school during lunch. When got high, came back, um, and a policeman was standing in the parking lot. He gave us a citation. I had to go to court. I got they gave me probation and got to do these drug classes and drug education. Got to go to night school and all because they kicked me out of school. Despite all this, Harry still doesn't see the dangers in smoking pot. Don't hurt me, did I say? Except for my memory, man short-term memory. Can't remember nothing. The video the teens watch is graphic. And the next thing I know, I hear this big crash, and it was the van had rolled on top of my legs. The real amputation is shown. It is too much for some. The victim's stories are heart-wrenching. She was at a party, and she decided to be the life of the party and get more alcohol. Um, and she got into her car with another girl, and they drove um, down that road and up that hill and killed that little baby. The nurses tell it to them straight and discuss certain procedures performed on every surviving crash victim. This tube is called an endotracheal tube. So where do you think it would go? If that doesn't make an impact, the catheter usually does. You know, it's nothing that you would really want to have done to you, trust me. But Harry is still unimpressed. Now they visit some patients. First stop is Ryan. Hi, Dave. You got your eyes open. Ryan was in a car crash when he tried to pass a friend on a country road. Ryan was going anywhere from 90 to 100 miles an hour. And his friend was going anywhere between 80 and 90 miles an hour. Ryan lost control of the car, and the car went in one direction, and Ryan went in the other and landed in the middle of the street. His friend, who was about 15 seconds behind him, came around the same corner and didn't see him and ran over him. The boys had left a party just minutes before. Ryan's mother is now a sobering teacher. He has a head injury. He's been in a coma for 12 days as of today. And um, the best thing that he's been able to do so far is open up his eyes. I don't know if he knows I'm there. I don't know if he's ever going to be able to hug me again. I don't know if he's ever going to walk again. Or play soccer or go back to school. He may never be able to feed himself or go to the bathroom on his own. Hi, honey. Hi, Dave. Hi. 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 Can you see me? I think the thing I'm most sorry about is when he walked out of the house that night, he didn't kiss me goodbye. And he may never kiss me goodbye again. The teens visit other rooms and then the emergency unit. Nurses target Harry, hoping to make an impact. That's the first thing somebody says in the admitting area is that I never thought this would happen to me. First thing you hear him say. Guess what? They're laying there in that bed. This tour truly is a dose of reality. About two tours each week come through the hospital, and the program does appear to be working. On the average, in a two-year period, only 9% of the teens will reoffend. And without the program, that reoffender number rises to about 33%. But not everyone gets the message. I don't understand why we got to come here anyway. We're here for drugs and stuff. Over here, same people got in car accidents. 60 to 70 percent of trauma patients are here because of drug or alcohol-related crashes. And I had been a patient at shock trauma. They saved my life. Nancy Obadal is one victim the children saw on the videotape. Her family drove to Baltimore for a day of fun. They were returning to Adams County when they saw a car speeding towards them. Uh, the Trans Am was traveling between 80 and 100 miles an hour. He was still accelerating when he hit us. The force of that car hat traveling at that rate of speed impacted our car and put the front all the way to the middle of the car. 
we were all seat belted in, but um, Greg and uh, the children didn't survive the scene of the crash. Her husband Greg and 12-year-old Damon, 14-year-old Erica, and her 14-year-old friend Jessica, all dead because of a 19-year-old drunk driver. Nancy barely survived. My, my skull had been fractured, my chest was crushed, I had multiple internal injuries, my eyes had been cut. She drifted in and out of consciousness for months. But I recognized my father's voice, and he was talking to me, trying to explain where I was and what had happened, that it wasn't September anymore, that now it was December, and that all of my family was dead. She missed their funerals. Anger overrode grief, fueling her recovery. If I gave in and died, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't any of the family left. Um, I just had to be angry enough about what had happened to survive, and, um, you know, then, then maybe it wasn't, evil didn't totally win. She's now deeply involved in Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Her advice to parents is be a role model. It shows that there's a big difference in families where parents have a zero tolerance message or when parents say, well, you know, I know kids are going to drink, but at least if they're going to drink, please don't drive. In those situations, then, they're the ones that are more likely to drink or more likely to drink after driving or more likely to get in a car with another person who's been drinking. The hope in her crusade is that other parents won't have to live what she is living. Now when I've, I've done my... My Christmas shopping, uh, part of it every year is ordering grave blankets. It isn't what a parent ever thinks about when they're having a family, that that's going to be their Christmas shopping list, but that's what mine is. We hope this program has been informative and helpful in addressing teenage driving issues. Where do you go from here? You've heard the advice from teens and from adults. Plus, there are handbooks for parents, courtesy of PennDOT. It is simple, wear your seatbelt, drive the speed limit, and stay sober to help prevent so many crashes. This program is dedicated to the teens who have died in our area, on our roads. These names are from just the past three years alone. Children who were old enough to drive, but way too young to die. Oh.